Want to advertise your business in a cost-effective way? It's time to give podcast advertising a try. Research shows a high rate of podcast listeners made a purchase as a result of an ad they heard on a podcast. Visit podbean.com slash brands to launch a cost-effective podcast advertising campaign in minutes. That's P-O-D-B-E-A-N dot com slash brands. Hello and welcome to episode 72 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings and 10 years ago I gave up my live stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret, never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. In this episode, I'm joined by photographer Derek D'Souza, the man behind some of those hugely iconic images of the jam at gigs and sound checks between 1979 and 1982. A man who was literally in the crowd taking photos of the band live. We'll talk about those images that you'll recognise from that session at London's Chiswick Park, his new book, In the Crowd, an upcoming exhibition, and so much more. This is another absolute corker of a guest, so let's get into it. Derek D'Souza, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Proper, proper legend in the jam circles, I have to say. Your name comes up so often when this band is being referred to. Um, a real golden period for a lot of fans because they just love looking at your images. So we'll dig into this and we'll talk about the new book in a second as well. But I have to understand, first of all, this jam obsession in a way. When when did you first get into the jam? Was it really early doors? Yeah, it was. I can remember hearing the first single on the John Peel show just before 18 and it was, um, I've never heard anything like it and it and it was just, it hit me straight away. And um, so I was a fan from then I hadn't heard of them before I just started going to gigs I hadn't really been out much before I know I was 18 but I kind of hadn't been I had a quiet life and hadn't been out a lot and I was in London and then I started going to gigs and then everything changed Wow. And did you know when you heard that single on, on um, in the city, did you know what they looked like Was or was it just the sound? Uh, just the sound. And then I saw them on top of the pops and I loved it because of the suits, which was not like anything else anybody was wearing at the time. And obviously the punk had come along and it was, I mean, I loved a lot of the music on the scene at the time. But for them, they sounded like a punk band, but they didn't look like one. So seeing them in the suits was quite weird. But again, seeing a band of the same age or, you know, a year or so older than me, was great. So what other bands were you seeing at that time? What other bands were you into? I hadn't really, I hadn't gone to see any bands. I think I just started going, I just was working in town. So I just started going out really, as I said. And um, then I started going to a few gigs and just different bands around London, really just going to small gigs and like the Boomtown Rats, sort of Steve Gibbons band, the Slits. I never got to see the Sex Pistols, unfortunately. The closest I got to see them was I saw the Slits supporting the Steve Gibbons band and I'm still on the stairs at, at um, it's Coco now, but it was the music machine in Camden. And Sid Vicious walked down the stairs and trod on my foot, yeah. spilled my beer. He was so polite and so apologetic. And that was, so that was the closest I ever got to seeing the pistols. He's completely, you've just completely ruined his image in one there. <laughs> I love the fact yeah, he's well, apologising. He was, he was kind of think he's going to be one thing and he was just, I'm so sorry, you know, and he sounded quite posh as well, actually. <laughs> um, but anyway, that was the closest I ever got to seeing him, unfortunately. Brilliant, brilliant. And can you remember the first time you saw the jam live then? I did. It was 70. I don't know why, because I had I just, I just started going out really in London and then the gigs kind of followed, sort of 78, 79. Um, then I started going to a lot. But it was I did have a note of it somewhere, but I did it was 78 was the first time. And I don't know why I didn't go sooner, but again, maybe I was just kind of finding my way in terms of going out. I was a young 18, you know, I probably looked about 14 at the time as well. So, um, and where was it? I didn't ever kept records of many bands that I saw. I just didn't bother. But oh. the jam, I did keep a lot. 1978, it was the music machine, which was um, Coco now. And that was in the March of uh, 78. So that would have been before all mod cons, which, is, which was the album. I can remember buying it, coming home and listening to it. And that's what kind of clinched it for me. I love the first album. Didn't like everything on the second one, but all more cons was this is serious now. This is this is my band, and and obviously I got to see him a lot of times. Yeah, they, I mean it's quite an extreme from not going out to suddenly being at a jam gig because they're pretty full on by the sounds of things, right? Yeah, the gigs were crazy. I mean, you could be. I mean, they were quite violent as well at times and quite scary. Um, you just get knocked about. You could be standing in one place and five seconds later, you were 30 feet away and no choice in the matter. Um, I think it was just to try and stay on your feet. There were times when you'd obviously get to know the songs, and but sometimes you'd have to choose between singing along and just breathing. Yeah. <laughs> Holding on for dear life. <laughs> really? Yeah, it was like that. Yeah. Yeah. To be fair, I've been in a couple of mosh pits well a solo like that. I remember the Isle of Wight um, going to see him at, must have been Osborne House, I think, which was been around 22 Dreams time. And man, that was pretty full on. I have to say, I was, I was front row, but clinging to the barrier 
it just pushing back <laughs> holding on for dear life you know <laughs> sometimes that front barrier is the safest place because just behind I think is worse yeah at least with a barrier you can't obviously unless you get crushed against it but um, but yeah just trying to push back sometimes and um, but the gigs but I, I do sometimes see that gigs like they don't see it much now but when you do you just think there's going to be a lot of people the next day who are in their 50s who are going to not be able to get out of bed <laughs> are going to be battered and bruised and thinking was that such a good idea <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> I did it the other night actually at the villagers gig which Paul Weller turned up at um, and oh, I right. went I went front row went to the barrier thought this is a good place there was no moshing it was a very calm lovely affair that's the kind of gig I like these days I'm getting on a bit <laughs> I saw the rifles recently and uh, in uh, Comedia in Brighton which is a really small venue and I was so close to the stage I could smell the toner on the set list <laughs> as my face was that close so often and then a couple of people were kind of looking out for the older boy at the front I was trying to take some pictures on my little camera as well but it was just great you know yeah. it was all good humour and the people weren't you know sometimes people can be they'll, they'll lash they are trying to hurt people you know they're trying to hit people which is not really what it's about is it I mean don't mind people knocking into each other a bit but when people start punching you and things like that yeah, no, exactly. There's a difference no. between we're all having fun to this is something entirely different, isn't it? And and hey, what an amazing feeling it is to be back to live music again, isn't it? Oh, fantastic. Sounds strange for me to say it, but I didn't actually miss it, which I thought I would. And I remember in between the second week, oh, sorry, the second week of March, I think whenever lockdown started, and the first week of June, I had something like 35 gigs in my diary. And I just accepted straight away that they weren't going to go ahead rather than going one by one as they cancelled and thinking, oh, disappointment, disappointment. I just decided I'm not going to go to keep myself safe. My, my family, my dad was quite elderly at the time. Just, just it was made that decision that we weren't going to go. And of course, they cancelled anyway. And I think, yeah, during, during the 18 months or, or year or so, whatever it was, um, I would work on some of the photographs I had taken and listen to the bands in the pictures. So for me, it was like going back. It was like being back at the gig. And that's what, you know, taking pictures is like. So it wasn't like I was away for 18 months, if that makes sense. And, and the result of this is this new book, In the Crowd, the 40th anniversary edition, which we're yeah. going to talk about, we're going to dig into. So I have to kick off with understanding. When did the love of photography happen? Was it, was it a very young age? I'd always, I think if there was ever a chance to, t- you know, to pick up a camera and take a picture, I'd always wanted to. But we didn't really have a camera until I think I was, I think we had a box brownie that someone had given us, which was, awful really and I did a couple of pictures on that and then when my parents bought a camera for a family holiday when I was I think I was about 12 11 or 12 maybe and again because film was expensive we couldn't just go mad I managed to try and take a few on it which I really enjoyed but of course had to be really restricted and then the first camera I got was when I was 19 I think my dad bought for me I just passed some exams or just about to and he bought this camera from me. And he was he convinced it was a Nikon, but it wasn't. It was this. Um, there was two two choices basically in the shop. This Zenith, which weighed a ton, this Russian camera, and another one, the Petri, looked a bit cooler and it was smaller and weighed half half as much. So I went for that, and um, and that's that's really when I got started. So not not having a chance before, I would have liked to have done it sooner, but it wasn't it wasn't possible. Yeah. And were you straight in there was gig, you know, taking photos of gigs, the thing that you wanted to do, or were you into wandering around the park, taking the wildlife? What was it? Just taking general stuff, really. I, I would take pictures. And then because I'd started going to gigs, like, you know, the year before proper, just thought, how now I can combine the two things that I love. Let's try. And the first gig I ever photographed, I, I, I'm sure, was the jam at the Rainbow in 1979 uh, on the Setting Suns tour. And I was trying to find out about how to take pictures at a concert. There was obviously no Google. I went to the local camera shop. They didn't know. Tried the library or a couple of libraries. Anyway, I just had to just try and find out a bit of information. It wasn't much available. And I went along thinking, you know, how hard can it be? And obviously a lot harder than I thought. Pictures, <laughs> I think I got about four pictures came out and um, the rest were just like blank on the, you know, just blank on the negative, clear on the negative, which means there wasn't enough light, basically. And I was just so disappointed you just got, you know, you used to have to pay for it all as well. You paid for the film and the processing to get, you know, pretty much nothing. So I just kept trying and, you know, practice and learning and just got better, but um, couldn't get any worse. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Because obviously these days, kids, you, you'll, you'll know, obviously you can take a photo on your phone or on a camera, look at the back of it, see if it's any good, take another one, take another one. That wasn't the case back in the day. No. You, yeah, you had to send it off or develop it yourself and you might be left with, with nothing at all. Lots of times. And you still, and you, as I said, you still have to pay for everything. Yeah. Because, you know, you'd still pay for the film and it's expensive back then. So... The most I could ever afford was like four rolls of film. And when I was sneaking my camera in, it wasn't like they were small gigs either. It would be like, I mean, it was like the jam gigs at venues like the Rainbow or Hammersmith. 
which are decent size, you know, sort of two, three thousand people. And trying to take a picture, it's just, <laughs> trying, you know, at a gig, it's not like, I mean, I was never in the pit. I've never, I was never in the pit for a jam gig. So it, I was always in the crowd and I'd always try and stand back maybe 10, 15 rows because security, even if they could see you, they were never going to come in into that yeah. mayhem and try and get you. They just wouldn't <laughs> bother. Yeah. Um, so I'd stand as far back as I could. But of course, you'd just be getting battered around, you know, the whole time. So I'd sneak, I'd, I'd have four films down my pants, more information than you wanted. And then I'd have the camera kind of without the lens strapped behind my, in my, small on my back. So if somebody fished you, they wouldn't see it. So I'd take a, a big jacket or a bag and hide hide the lens underneath. It's only ever had one lens, or I get someone else to take it in. This is brilliant. You're like James Bond, oh. man. <laughs> <laughs> I remember once at the rainbow. I have to tell you this funny story. I'd, I'd been practicing with. Um, I had the, like the lens strapped to my leg, and like I'd like a pair of like American football socks to try and keep it in, and then taped it to my leg. And I was practicing walking at home, so I didn't like walk with a limp. And I put it in, the, there's a pub near the rainbow, I forget what it was called, but I, t- I remember going to the toilet, putting the lens into my sock and strapping it all up. And then at the rainbow, between the front door and the second door, I don't know, say it's like 20 feet, the lens started to come undone, the tape started to unravel. So I'm stood there on the floor, and there was, you know, I'm crouched down on the floor while the security are watching me, quite clearly something wasn't right. So as I got to the door, obviously they found the lens, they were laughing. And then they said to me, you know, off you go into hand it into the office. And they were just laughing about it and joking amongst themselves. And as they turned, I just went in straight in with the gig anyway. <laughs> oh, so I never handed it in. I took it in anyway. But after all that, I just, should just walked in with it. So did you immediately start sending your work to the band's fan club offices? Was that right? Or was it when you felt you had something that's good? Yeah. I say the first year I didn't take pictures. Second year, it was just one gig at the end. That was the first time. And the pictures, were, I mean, I would never have sent them because they were awful, really. Um, and then. 1980, I started getting some better shots, and then 81, you know, better still, and then that one, I, I sent some in from a couple of the gigs. I also took some off the TV because I think back then there was no video. If you wanted to watch something, you know, if you knew they were on TV, you made sure you came home to watch it. So I remember putting the, the camera on a tripod and just thought I'll try taking some pictures off the TV, and some came out okay. And I didn't realise there's a signal, so you get a light black line across it on some of them, which you can't see when you're watching it. It's just a signal how it works. Anyway, when it was, I think it was a uh, yeah the start video. You know, you know the solo that Paul does. It like it goes kind of all technical and um, yeah. and I took some and one of those came out really well. So I sent that with some other pics, and then he wrote back to me. He said he really liked them and he loved the one off the TV. And he liked the color, and then I sent some more, and that's when they got in touch. A lot of people have mentioned this, like Jam fans on the podcast, the sound check and the fact that you know the access that fans had to to the band in a way, both before the gigs and after the gigs, was incredible. And there's this, this stuff you mentioned, the Rainbow Theatre, which was just, originally was the Finsbury Park story. I didn't realise this; it was one of the largest cinemas in the world at one point. But so many iconic bands have played there, from the Beatles, the Who. It was the theatre where Jimi Hendrix first burned to guitar and then had to go. I to didn't, hosp- oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, then had to go to hospital because his fingers were all burnt. <laughs> uh, but bands like the Faces, Pink Floyd. Even even Frank Zappa's played there. Um, and you got into the sound check. There's this wonderful shot you took of Paul with a, of a fag in his guitar, which is just brilliant. That was the first time I photographed the sound check. So that was a year right. okay. after the Rainbow gig. Yeah, just almost a year. And um, again, with the gigs, because security was strict, I went to a lot of gigs but never took the camera because you didn't want it to get smashed, for one thing. And it was just so difficult in there. And, you know, so I didn't really do it a lot. But once you start getting some shots, you kind of become, well, became addicted to it. And you think, this is all, this is my favourite band. I want, no matter what, I'm going to get in my camera in and try and yeah. capture it. But the sound check, that particular one, I remember it was in November and uh, it was cold outside. And they always did sound check around five-ish. There wasn't many people, I don't think, but say there was between 30 and 50, I don't know, kids, really. And then John Weller ushered us in from the side door, which he, which he did, which was just brilliant. And he felt it was like it was really very respectful and very quiet because you kind of it was like you know whispering and shushing and uh, and then obviously the band come in and um, Paul had this uh, like a, a bit like the style council type scarf, this long scarf and um, that white denim jacket. He just looked, well, he always looked cool. You know, he could put it in a bin bag and he would probably look cool. <laughs> um, but he came in and he stuck the cigarette in the end of the guitar, which you know, and it was quite really dark and there wasn't much light and. Um, I wasn't using a flash. I, don't, I didn't use a flash. Um, I didn't want to sort of draw attention to myself. But that actual shot, it got chopped because it was so underexposed and the negative. When, when they put these through these machines, they just look for a, a break between the shots and it just chops, you know, so it just chops straight through the picture. 
So it's only later on I got the two halves and had it and mm-hmm. had them scanned and then restored it because that shot would have been lost because he's hardly could barely see it on the negative. It was so clear in terms of exposure and everything. It's not the best shot, but I just think it. it I've seen a picture of John Lennon with a guitar I mean, the cigarette in his, and he just reminded me of that. And he just looks so cool. It does look cool, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a cool. Yeah. <laughs> it does look really cool. There's a lovely photo as well of John Weller talking to Bruce, which I saw that you shared on socials yeah. as well. Which because it made you feel like and I think you've said this before too. It, it made you feel like. Like the whole band are his boys, I think is how you phrased it. That's, which I thought yeah, was lovely, right? Yeah. Because I think if it was Paul, it could almost be like the obvious shot. You know, that's him and his son, which would have been a great shot as well, to be honest. But the fact it wasn't his son, I think that just made it in some ways more special because without, well, without John, there was no band. You know, yeah. he did so much for them. And, and not just him, but the family. You know, Nikki and Anne did such a lot supporting them. That's no disrespect to Bruce and, you know, Rick's family. I don't know what involvement they might have, but these guys were directly involved with the band so they might have been supportive but this was obviously the you know just to do with the, the band themselves so um yeah and he was great I mean, he would let he, he let so much many of us in it became expected but you still realize how special it was but it was it was a privilege you know but you kind of hope you always kind of expect it would happen but every time it did it was like i can't believe we were in the sound check you know it was that kind of feeling afterwards yeah i was wondering this the other day because obviously paul's about to go back on tour the point of recording we're what three weeks away from him starting the winter tour finally in the uk i was obviously sound checks are still a thing they have to do a sound check but i was wondering i was like so they let the fans in would they let the fans in what time do they happen is that still a thing i don't know um i know the time it usually kind of does between sort of 4 30 and 5 so people get to know stuff like this so things like so you'll get fans who will turn up at a venue knowing that's the time he's going to set. Probably not helpful if I'm just, that it wasn't a secret. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't a secret. Sorry, you know. Sorry Paul. <laughs> yeah. It's about as much of a secret as who won the cup final last year. So it's not, you know, <laughs> as if I'm sharing a privileged information. But people will wait, you know, to try and get photos or get something signed. I don't think they let them in so much. Um, I guess because, of, I mean, sometimes just a number of people which sometimes yeah. becomes difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I mean, they were, they were big at the time. It wasn't like they were, you know, like a little band. It was, it was a big deal. And I can't imagine... I don't, I don't know anyone else has ever done it like that. Not so many people. Some bands have less people at their gigs than the, than the jam had at sound tricks, So, yeah. And you feel that kind of, and I think that still is part of the legacy as well, this chemistry, this connection between the band and the fans is so special. But you mentioned John Weller. The other thing I love about the photos of John Weller is, um, I mean, he always looks fabulous as well. This beautiful silver mane, this kind of silver fox that he was, is so fabulous. But he sounds like such an amazing guy. He was such an amazing guy as well. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really know him well. I found out the first time I met him, I just um, was to speak to him about the pictures. And um, i just broken my two of my fingers the week before. So my arm was taped up from like, the fingers to the elbow. And when I met John, he proper squeezed my hands. I think, I'm sure he broke them again, to be honest, but I had a little tear out of my eye. I thought it was a white, you know, on a short sleeve shirt, a white bandage. It's not like he couldn't have seen it, but I think just, obviously just from habit, but it was uh, a painful introduction. Um, but as but well as treated me so well, if, someone, if one of my friends came over to my house, my mum and dad would treat people in the same way. And that's what it reminded me of, uh, you know, you know, doing a cup of tea, do you want something to eat? Just that that was, again, another thing that made it so special. I think one of the things for me is I still always think of myself as a fan first and then a photographer second, really. Uh, and that's why I think it's worked for me. And and it's nice when people like what you do. And I, and I think that's part of it, a big part of it, really. I mean, 1981, you must have been like your mind, mind blown as a fan. Uh, so not only do you get to take shots on the Buck and Spade tour, which was this, this really hot summer in, um, uh, in Guildford. And actually, let's touch on that, because I think uh, you talked about how hard it was to get the three of them in one shot, because they're constantly moving. No, no, it's not standing still at any point, right? So, But you get this amazing shot with this, this beautiful white kit of Rick's and all three of them in the one shot. Was that something you were always trying to capture? Well, you tried, but it's so hard because... Because the thing is, it's not like now where you had autofocus, you had to manually focus. So what I would always do, I would focus on the microphone because when you're 60 feet, 70 feet, whatever it is away, 80 feet, that doesn't make a lot of difference. If you, if you were standing close to someone and you did that, you'd miss the shot. You know, now I was focused on the eyes right. because that close, it would make such a difference. You know, you know, the nose might be out of focus, but their eyes would be in focus. But from that far away, and of course, Paul had to come to the mic because he was singing. Uh, Bruce was much more different because he was so animated on stage it's very difficult because unless he was singing it was hard because he'd be on the move all the time so he could never focus and get a shot you just it just was so difficult so he'd focus on the mic and then wait for him to come to the mic obviously and rick you couldn't even see him sometimes because behind this massive the great white they called it or it was called kit of his with the massive tom-toms in front of him unless you were higher up and i've got shots from low down you just can't see him at all you had to be <laughs> higher up than the stage 
to see him. Could you not fit a little step ladder up your trousers as well? <laughs> well, I think I'd enough stuff up there. I'd have nothing <laughs> in my trousers as it was, to be honest. But <laughs> pair of stilts. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you and you captured some brilliant shots on that. But the real big one, the one that everybody knows and loves, and these really special pictures are the ones at Chiswick House. And so this was August 1981. Tell me how that came about. Well, I'd sent the pictures into the fan club, and and I said that that they'd poorly written back and really liked them. And I sent some more on the Monday. And then I was coming home on the Tuesday and I popped into the snooker club where my dad would go and I used to go. With. My dad had, had got me to join this place. But when you join, when you're 18 and everyone in there seems like they're about in their 70s, it's not a place you want to go. I started playing snooker in the So I went in there on the way home from work and I was just about to leave. And my dad said, oh, by the way, some weller woman rung for you. <laughs> which, which was, which I can remember the words, which is so strange because he would never, he never normally would say that. He would say, Mrs. Weller or Anne Weller or something. But some weller woman rang for you about a photo, about a photo shoot to call you back because I knew I'd sent pictures the, the day before so they might must have just arrived that day this was the Tuesday I think and I posted them on the Monday some of the new pictures and so I literally ran home and um, no phone call this is, and I stayed in and I've never stayed in at that time you know being that age so many nights and then Sunday night Anne phoned again and she said I'm so sorry I lost your number I said I oh, know it's fine and um <laughs> And then she said, look, we really like your pictures. We would like to, like to meet you to talk about doing a photo session for the band, which was like, you know, obviously couldn't believe it. And um, after work, I remember going to, so I didn't drive at the time. So I remember going to Woking and Anne, would, Anne met me at Woking Station and then took me to that to their house and um, and I showed them my pictures. Uh, I remember the first time she just got this, a new car. This Remember those Fiat X19s? <laughs> right. This green car. And of course, when we went to leave, she couldn't work out how to turn the lights on. So she took John's Mercedes and drove me, dropped me back to Woking Station so I could get a train home. Um, but they were great and they just treated me really well. I think another time I went and, you know, I had Nick come straight from work. So she'd and do me some dinner, you know, sitting down with a cup of tea in the house. And I'm thinking, I can't believe I'm in the house with Paul's parents, you know, it's just That's it's brilliant. Straight. I mean, I didn't meet the band till later. So I'd arranged a day to meet the band in the studio, up at Air Studios in Oxford Circus, which is George Martin's place. And the night before, I didn't mention this in the first book because I felt really bad. I didn't want my, I didn't want my dad to be upset. I got, um, I got arrested the night before. <laughs> I've been out with some friends in London. I think there's like four or five of us. And I was walking along and uh, it was like sort of mid-evening and um, there was a tra- plastic, you know, those plastic tra- traffic cones just on the side of the pavement. I just flicked it with my foot and it just wobbled a little bit. That was, didn't fall over anything. Next thing I heard the voice shout out, you're in the blue, stop. And we all looked down, we were all wearing blue. So not sure who it was. Not thinking of what, for what I've just done is such a, you know, big yeah. deal. <laughs> and then we, t- we all turned around. It was a young, there was two coppers and a young copper and he said, you're, you're nicked for being drunk or disorderly. So, well, I'm, I'm not drunk. I'm certainly not disorderly, but that was it in the back of the van. So I had to go on my own with, with the police, obviously. And I went to um, the local station. I had to stay in a cell for a couple of hours. Wow, blimey. Uh, <laughs> and then they said, you've got to go court in the morning, Horse Ferry Road Magistrates Court. I said, I can't do tomorrow morning because I'm meeting the jam in the studio. And the bloke was like, yeah, I don't care what you're doing. You're, you're going to court. I don't care what your plans are. So it was like, oh, God, I've got to go court. You know, I've got to do this now. So I went in a suit and I took a change of clothes with me. Uh, and I'm trying to think, I remember, I remember seeing a guy from school who'd been expelled was a, for being a psycho. And he was in a police uniform. He had a sergeant stripes on his arm. Well, that, that, was a bit, that was quite a worry. I never spoke to him, but I thought that was quite concerning. So you can't stay in school, but I want to join the police. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, and I had to wait ages to, to go into court. And I said to the guy who was like on the desk, you know, I've really got to get away. He said, sorry, nothing you can do. And I said, look, I didn't really do anything either. I think this is really unfair. He said, look, just go in. Say you're sorry, pay your five pounds, you won't get a criminal record, you know, and go. So I've gone in and I'm in the in the court. And the bit that came into my mind just straight away was the bit in Quadrophenia with Jimmy and, and uh, Ace are in court. And I just said he was like, what have you got to say for yourself? And I want to I want to say, you know, you take cash or check and just be cocky. <laughs> I thought I just I said, no, no, Your Honor, I'm very sorry I haven't. And that was it. I thought just get out, pay the money and go. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, so I left. <laughs> Jumped in a cab, went to my friends, got changed, you know, literally kept the cab waiting to just quickly get changed back in the cab up to Oxford Circus. And as I went into the building, there's a lift at the bottom. And as the door opened, George Martin walked out wow. of the lift. So I've gone, hi, George. He said, hello, young man. So we went in and then got to meet the band. And um, they were great. You know, I was obviously really nervous. And they were recording at the time. They were recording Absolute Beginners and Tales from the Riverbank. So it was quite funny seeing them do their bits. And uh, at one point, I'm sitting on, a, on an amp in front of Paul, who's about three foot away doing his guitar parts, just sitting there watching him. I thought, you know, I have to pinch myself. And then he said, uh, listen, have a break. Do you fancy a game of pool? 
So so we'll play double. So you and me will play and we played um Joe and Kenny, the minders, um, and we won <laughs> two one. For me, that was as big a deal as my football team winning anything, which they haven't done for a long time. It was a great experience. And then that night I was going to see, I remember going to see Susie the Banshees at Hammersmith Odeon, which is beside the point, but um, it was just a hell of a day. What a day, my God. Did you tell them they'd been in the neck? <laughs> um, no, I didn't mention it because I just, you know, you know, so there's only one chance to make the first impression. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. And also, no matter how you tell the story, it doesn't always sound... Um, so good, and I never. And so I've never put it in the first book because I thought my dad would be upset if he reads it. And then I think when I told Nikki, this was the year before the Somerset House or that year of the Somerset House exhibition. I saw Nikki, and I was telling the story. She said, "You've got to include this in, in the book that, that, that they was that they were working on." I said, "Well, I have to check with my dad first, <laughs> only because I didn't want him to be upset, you know." Yeah. Um, but I told him he just laughed. He just said. Sort of, <laughs> It's that's hilarious, and um, but it wasn't like I did anything back, you know. It was just no, such no, a no. stupid thing. No, yeah, but it kind yeah. of added to, you know, <laughs> it became part of the story. I guess it becomes part of the story, doesn't it? And yeah, oh, that's so funny. And how did Chiswick House come about? Because am I right in thinking that Paul wanted the only reason it was at Chiswick House was because of the Beatles? Is that right? Because they yeah, did, yeah, definitely. They did a couple of promo films the time. there. Wasn't it? Yeah, um, he never said a word about it, and it was really Paul had decided. The brief sort of was there was lots of these statues there, and to try and get picked, they were going to wear dark suits. And then you had like the colours in the background and then the statues. That was the idea to capture that. And because I'd never done a photo shoot before for anybody, it was like my very first one. I said, I had no idea. I mean, now I would go and check the venue, check the location first. Didn't do any of that. Just turned up on the day with no clue whatsoever. I mean, the only good thing was I kind of knew my equipment, which was pretty basic, really. I thought to myself, I knew it really well. But when I look at it, it was two or three knobs and a couple of dials. And there's not much really to do on it. But I was comfortable with it. Um, but the difficult part is when it's like bright sunshine. Now you can see exactly what you're taking and then check it. Then you, you couldn't do that. You had to take it and wait till you got them done. So the good thing I was familiar. But the only thing I would have done, I would have used some pictures where there was shadow. I would have used a flash. Didn't know enough to do that. I think I'd literally had a couple of lenses and a couple of cameras and not much idea. But we kind of just walked around. And Paul never mentioned about Beatles at all. We walked around different spots, and it, it was it was good because it was a it was a good collaboration between us all. But I'd seen things, I thought let's try this, and they were really good. They were really patient with me, and you know they would try anything, and they were just I think well, they were really relaxed as well. There was two girls I was really friendly with, and they came along. There was four young lads as well who came along again, not being professional at all. Inviting <laughs> them a massive along crew, with you. your mates. Oh, I know. <laughs> four guys. I think they were just so overwhelmed. They, they didn't speak almost. They just kind of like that. And they had to leave after a little while. I think it was just too much for them, really. Um, and the girls were great because I think it kind of relaxed everybody as well. And they, you know, they were chatting with the band and obviously they were fans as well. They're all fans. And um, I think we went two or three hours in and it was really nice walking around and doing it. I think now I haven't, I've been back a couple of times and you just think there's things I would have done differently, but then maybe I wouldn't have got the shots I did. There was one where we walked by a window and just, I just had to catch the reflection, just the way the light was at the time. And you could see them in the reflect. The one that was on the inside on the lyric sheet. And just as we saw that, I saw the light. I just thought, I thought, let's try that. Trying to get again with, with, the, with you know, with manual and the film, you can't tell how it's going to come out. And just trying to get them to move and adjust and and get the shot. Because when you focus on things, if you focus on a reflection, it's not like say it's on the. You don't focus on the glass. You have to focus on on the reflection, which is further back in the window. If that makes sense. I'm not explaining yeah. that at all. Well, no, no, sure no. Somebody, no. somebody, somebody, somebody will, <laughs> a photographer now to explain that properly. But there were shots that we tried and things, and they were really good. And um, the ones with the statues, because Paul had made a big deal of the statues. So me taking it so literally must get the statues, um, which was great. Apart from the fact they were about 13, 14 foot tall, <laughs> which obviously when you got somebody even if like somebody six foot, you know, against the 13 foot statue. You know, again, I should have. Tried different things and maybe change the angles, but like I say, it was my first time. And uh, presumably, you were absolutely bricking it as well. Were you it being your first time? Um, well, I, w- I was really nervous, but not to the point where I wouldn't say I was starstruck because I wouldn't about to, I wouldn't about to function. You know, you have to yeah. you have to kind of get on with what you're doing. And and I didn't I did enjoy it. I was nervous. I, mean, I know Rick had said, you know, we knew you were nervous, of course, but we didn't make it difficult. Of course, you know, they were really good and uh, they were all really accommodating. They couldn't have been. More, it could have been nicer, really. I guess also um, the nerves come from wanting to do a really good job as well, don't you? And that that yeah, of course. And that fear of yeah. getting back, getting the shots back, and getting getting like you said before, like yeah, yeah, your, your shots that nothing. actually you can't use, you've got nothing there. Yeah, but sometimes I was quite relieved because I gave the films films to Bruce after, so it's kind of like it wasn't my responsibility. Anymore, <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't me to get them, you know, to get them messed up. But um, yeah, it was it was a big deal, and uh, and you can imagine if they hadn't worked out, it would have been. 
uh, got someone else and done something different, and that would have mm. been it. And my whole life would have been different. Yeah, um, God, yeah. So the one point where you're trying to find the tree that the Beatles sat in. So you did, but you didn't know this. You didn't know this is no, why no. you're there. <laughs> Paul was looking apparently, but he never again. He never mentioned it. I saw him. Um, was it 2015 on tour? Nicky had arranged for me to go meet him, and I thought then I said to him. I asked him the question because I had never asked him before. And I said, to, did you know the Beatles had been photographed there? And he just said, of course I fucking did. <laughs> that was his exact words to me. And I remember in the, in the documentary, he said, in excuse to shoot where the fabs had been photographed. But he never said it at the time. I remember Anne telling me that he'd got, I think they'd bought a load of these Beatles magazines at like a, a charity shop. And Paul taking them home, took his clothes out of the drawer and put them on the floor, put the Beatles magazines in the drawer because they were more important than his clothes. Um, <laughs> But LC was a massive fan. So, yeah, he did know. It's only like much, much, much later that I'd seen pictures of them doing, is it the rain and paperback, right? The videos yeah, recorded right. there. Yeah. And um, we never did those two bits. But then we wouldn't have seen the videos probably then because they wouldn't have been available for us to see. So yeah. you would have only known the pictures, not the video. Because yeah. there was um, like a greenhouse, but there was a, there was a building there. And we took the couple outside and we never went inside it. And I think if he'd known... We definitely would have gone in there because that would have been a good spot to do it. But and am I right in thinking one of them is in the National Portrait Gallery? Shot of them behind yeah, the bars. one from the, the one from behind. Yeah, and I remember that was my idea to take the shot of the gate. Just um, it just looked interesting. That was all. That's all I was trying to think of. You know what? What could we do? You know what people are like. They will look at it and they say, "Pull slightly further away from the other two. And was he? Did he feel trapped in the band? And I think it was. No, we were just three guys stood behind a gate while I was taking a picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, sorry, that's shattered anyone, anyone's illusions or, but sometimes people, you know, you can read into something and it was just that we took just an idea to try this and see how it worked. That That's all it was really. Yeah. And there's um, probably, there's probably other shots where the ones that you didn't use, maybe where they're slightly closer together and all that as well, isn't it? Just the way it goes. Um, but he looks so cool. I mean, the whole band looks so cool. They've got these yeah. Movies. Brilliant blue suits on. Weller's got these round sunglasses. They look so cool, don't they? Yeah, I remember because he had them in his pocket. And the one where we did is one with the statue. And I said to him, can you put the glass on? Can I have a look? And he said, yeah, you put them on. I said, oh, that looks great. Can we do it with the glass on as well? And, and obviously he looked, you know, it, yeah. it looked great with them on. It just suited him. I yeah, remember trying to get a pair made. I'd gone to India that Christmas. And I remember trying to get him. The guy was like banging his bit of metal. And it just looked like a hexagonal battered piece of metal with sort of round glasses in the middle. It never looked quite the same. And it never looked the same on me anyway. But um, yeah, he just looked, when they all looked good on the day, he had them on with the sunglasses, but they just looked really cool. And he, as he often did. He always seemed to know what, you know, what, what, he, what he was doing in that sense. Every kind of image looked so iconic from regardless of, no disrespect, but regardless of who the photographer is. Yeah. Every, every really, one of those sessions seems to, you know, he certainly knew what, you know, was driving it forward and knew what he wanted to get. Yeah. Back to live performance, there's a couple of other um, ones I wanted to talk to you about. One was as we head towards the end of the jam, um, so we, we're into, you know, 80, end of 81, 1982. You're at Hammersmith Palais for, they did, was it four nights they did in London and you were there it for was, the... It was four, yeah, four nights in London, two nights at the Michael Sobel and then two nights at the Hammersmith Palais. There's this wonderful shot where you've got, um, you were trying to get Bruce, Paul and Bruce in the air at the same time. Yeah, right? again, there was no pit. So um, I was, I thought, well, if I go in the crowd, I'm just going to get knocked about. And it was a, it was only the sort of second time I think I'd had a pass, like a proper pass. But right. what I didn't even realise, I never thought to say, for me, it was the pass, it just meant I didn't have to put things down my trousers <laughs> and I could get stuff in legally. But I never thought about, should I go in the pit? There wasn't a pit there. Or should I, can I go to the side? Things that I just didn't know. Like now I would say, can I do this and check before where I can go? But I just had no clue really. So, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I, you wish you'd done this and that, but, can't change what you didn't do. So, yeah, so I thought, let's go in the balcony because it's when it's higher up, so I'm not going to get knocked about. If I get in a spot, then I can see the whole stage, I see everyone. So this first night, they did um, pretty much the same set, but they did Boy About Town. They both jumped in the air, and I'd never seen them do it before. And, of course, I never got a picture. I was watching the gig as well. I only had, I think, like four rolls of film each night, which is 160 pictures, which is nothing, really. Oh, God, I, yeah. could eat, I could do... 2,000 shots in the same amount of time now. I could yeah. do more. Yeah, I'm doing that on my mobile. <laughs> That's See, nothing, it's just it? so yeah. easy. But then yeah. you're having to watch and kind of pick your moments. And again, still even like now, you could try and pick that moment. But even with like, the, the gear I had was amateur. And uh, I remember mean, like the two cameras, like, the one lens, because there's no point having like, a wide angle when you're, so, you're already that far enough away. Second night, I wonder, wonder if they'll do it again. This time, I made sure there was enough frames when it came to that song. Uh, I made sure there was, it wasn't like the last shot of the film or anything. 
And then I was watching, I had the whole stage. I could see John sitting at the side there watching as well. And of course, then they jumped and they did it and I got it, which was great. Because even when people see, sometimes they see like these jump, like a shot like that. And they think, you know, you, these cameras are shooting, you know, 10 frames a second or something. And you just pick out the best one. But it wasn't because the lighting is so low, mm. so dark in there. So 90, 90 times out of 100, it would have been one shot. You just trying to pick at that moment where somebody's at the, the apex of the jump because either that is on the way up or the way down. You're trying to pick that one shot. And even now we've got, you know, far better gear. You might get two or three at the most. Again, one of them might, if you get it right at, at that moment, the other two are never as good. But yes, yeah, so I was so pleased to get it. And the fact John was in the picture as well. And you can see everybody, you know, on the stage and great to capture it. Obviously, um, 82, the band announced that there's going to be no more. How did you feel as both uh, somebody working with the band, but also this fan who's been there since the beginning? First, I was gutted. One of my favourite band, you know, you know, one thing, you know, the progression with the, with the music and they just seem to be getting better and better. So you, you didn't want that to end. But then I also thought, well, nobody else does this. Nobody else packs it in when they're at the top of their game. And I just thought, I just had so much respect for Paul for doing it because in part of me thinks he might be crazy to do it. But then to, to be, you know, if you're sure that's not what you want to do anymore or you want to do something different, then to have the, the guts to do that, fair play to him. I bumped into Bruce fun enough in the King's Road just after it was announced. And he was obviously devastated. And I just said to him, you know, what's going on? And he said, oh, you know, put this Paul's decision. We don't want to split, but we have to abide by it. But I was actually, yeah, I was dis- I was gutted. But then, as I said, you know, I, I respected it. When you look back now, I mean, 40 plus years on, it stands up, doesn't it? As a decision, that legacy the band have left is, I can't think of any other band from that time, kind of, you know, you say, gone out on the top and, and left that kind of history. Yeah. I mean, normally bands have split up for something for some reason that either they hate each other or someone's left or something's happened, but it wasn't really like that. And for them to do that, yeah, I thought it was amazing. And uh, I can't, yeah, like you say, I can't think of anyone else who's done it at that point because the natural thing, if you're doing so well, is to carry on. Yeah, of course, you know, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. which which, I, which is understandable. Um, but for me, funny people rarely talk to me about the Style Council, but I love them just as much because it was the next stage of my own life. You know, being that little bit older. And the next, you know, change of what thing, whatever was going on in my own life. Um, so I loved them and I saw them a lot, but I just never got to photograph them much because it was much harder to get cameras at the gigs. I mean, it used to be in, back in the day with some of the gigs, you'd have almost like a commissionaire. You might be a guy like in his 50s or 60s with a, with a red jacket on and a shirt and tie and a hat. Then later on, you had, you know, these guys, um, a bit like paramilitary almost, you know, the people who were the security. So like the old guys never going to come and get you, but these guys would. Plus getting the camera in became much more difficult because cameras became more easily, more, you know, more, much cheaper, more easily available. So it was harder unless you had a pass to get the camera in. But yeah, I thought they were great. And I, I love the fact it was a change direction and you could see that. You know, it was painfully obvious that Paul Al, he must have felt restricted in the jam and he was relaxed and he was like a different person. But the music was still great. And, you know, even more clever, I think, with the lyrics and even more political. It just shows what a good writer he was. But I, lo- I love this old council. And also, I guess there's that thing. I, th- I see this so often now with live gigs where people, and I do take the odd photo and maybe the odd video occasionally as well. So many people watch the entire gig through their phone, through their lens, whatever. And I guess as a photographer, there's a bit of that where you're you're having to spend the time to, you know, you're watching the gig down the lens, try and get the right shot and stuff. Whereas actually with the style council, you're just free. You can just watch the entire yeah. thing having to worry about taking a photo, right? If I'm at a gig and um, I don't feel I have to have a camera, but then there'll be something will happen. You think that would have been a great shot. That so that does happen from time to time. Yeah, and it's different as well when you're when you're taking pictures. The camera is in front of your face. I mean, some of the phones now and they're more like iPads and phones the size yeah. of phones, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or iPad Mini. So they're big and the screens are really bright and people hold it up above their head. They like whole songs or you know sometimes you know more than one song. So often you end up watching the gig through the person in front of you's phone. I think it would be hypocritical of me to criticise people in a way because people say, well, that's what you do at gigs. But it's not the same because you, I don't, very, I mean, at the odd shot, I might hold the camera up, but then you don't see my screen because of, it's off. So it's only when I'm looking through it. So it's not a distraction for people. And it's in front of my face. So if I turn my face, yeah, then the, the camera's in front of it. So it is, the, and even if I'm at a gig and shooting, I was shooting last night, I'll move about. So I'm not in one person's, in their way, like, for long periods, but some of these gigs you see people, you know, they're videoing song like whole songs, and then you just see a sea of screens in front of you sometimes. And then some people put the searchlight on on their phone. You know, <laughs> it's not just like a little, it's not like a torch. It's ridiculously bright. I don't know. I think the part of it is I understand people wanting to capture a memory of an event, 
because that's a big thing for people as well. But just sometimes it, it's a bit, just enjoy the gig sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's absolutely. a bit much. And, yeah. and, and it does obviously affect other people because if you've got the search light on or there's 10 screens in front of you, then, you know, it does affect the people behind. But then yeah. some gigs, you're so far away, you end up watching it on the massive screen, which is a bit better anyway. That's, that's true. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but also another reason why I try and get front row. So you've not got those people in the way. But also, if I, yeah. do, want to, if I do want to capture something, I can just hold the phone to my chest and get a good view on it. Um, but the great thing is, as well, in recent years, we've seen you back with Weller. We've seen so, solo year Weller and photographs from you as well. So um, what have you made of the solo career? I'm guessing you've been there through the whole journey as well. Yeah, I've, I've loved it. I mean, I, I like the fact he doesn't just do the same thing. I mean, sometimes people find a formula and it works for them and they stick with it. And so much sounds the same, but I've never known anybody that I can think of who's got such a variety of music in their career. I mean, he should be, he should, for me, I mean, I know we feel he's like a national treasure here, but you go to other countries, people never heard of him. And it's, we're so spoiled, I think. Mm. Someone who's got such a great career. And if you had to pick, I mean, there's people who are international superstars who I would struggle to fill 11 tracks to do a greatest hits. You'd be looking at a massive box set because there's so many good songs. I don't like everything because, you know, I don't just follow blindly. You like what you like, but just just an amazing body of work over so many years. And it's almost like different, not like Bowie with different characters, but like the jam was completely different to the style character, which is completely different to the solo. And even in more recent years, you know, the more recent stuff is so different to what he's done before. That's the beauty of it. And the fact that he's constantly moving forward has come up a lot on the podcast. I was thinking about this the other day because there's an element where, you know, he's about to go back on tour. There's an element where I do love some bands who will play more greatest hits, right? This is not, this is not me having a disc ball, don't worry. But sometimes I just wish my memory was better of those Wildwood days of Stanley Road and each album that he does. You know, Sonic Kicks, I remember going to the Roundhouse and seeing that for the first time. I was there Sunday night. I don't think the album was even out, but I'm, maybe I had a promo copy. And I remember him doing the album from start to finish, right? That's the last time he's going to do that. A lot of those songs don't even feature in the set now. I love that album, but... I wish my bloody memory was better to remember that. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I wish, they could, I wish they could video every single gig, I guess is what I'm saying. And, and but the photographs do help, don't they? They help to take you back. It yeah, does, it's def- remarkable definitely for me. Way. I can remember, sometimes I can't remember why I went into a room. You know, I might go back to go back and go back in. So I'm not sure why I was there, but um, but pictures, I could see a picture and, I, and I'd know what gig it was from. Even sometimes I'll, I'll see a picture and I think, I think that's one of mine because I've taken so many. It's amazing how much stuff you can remember. But it does, and that's what I'm saying, even lockdown, that thing of working on pictures from gigs and listening to the band. See, I never felt like I had that 18 months away from it because when you're looking at it and what you've done, it takes you back to that moment. But I love the fact that his stuff has been contemporary. Um, I forget the guy's name, but um, somebody on the BBC asked him the question. He said, but when you go and see a band, Paul, do you want to play the greatest hits? And he was well, like, yeah, I do. <laughs> so it's not like double standards, but you can understand why. But yeah. he's never done it. This is a bit, the thing that amazes me, it amazes me that people are still surprised that he doesn't do it because he's never done it. So why do you think he's going to do it now? Yeah. You know, it's always been, you know, the latest stuff that he's working on. He's always moving forward. And I, I love that. And yes, he'll do some of the older ones. Um, it's got such, so much stuff to choose from. I don't get hung up on, that, was, that wasn't a cheap, Pun there, sorry. I don't get hung up on um oh he hasn't gonna play this, or he hasn't done the old one. I mean, I like to hear the new ones, and it's always been that way. So I remember going to see the Who at Wembley and in fact the jam were, there was mentioned them playing, which they played in 78 at, at the Wembley Stadium, and they didn't do it for some whatever reason they didn't do it. The shame could have been great. But but the Who played it was only the one gig on the Saturday, and they played the greatest hits, which is what I knew. And I read in the NME the or music paper the following, and, they, and it was slagged the gig off, and it was but everyone I saw was having a great time. And even when we left, it was hard getting home, but everyone was in such a great mood. And I thought, was that the same gig that I was at the review? It was only the one gig, but that made also taught me a lesson to not just believe what you read in the music press. Yeah, very true. Um, and it's also just one person's opinion. I remember seeing the Manic yeah. Street Preachers at the O2. I don't know what year this would have been, maybe 10, 12 years ago. Um, and they did, it was the singles. So they did literally from the first single all the way up to now. And that was all the gig was, was just every single single. And it was a one off and it was bloody brilliant. It was great. So I do, I can understand, you know, how, how that would be a couple. I just, yeah, I mean, God, that would be like a five hour gig for Weller now, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be like a Springsteen gig. July 2019, I'm going to take you back to Greenwich Naval College. This was the penultimate night of the tour. Um, the tour was the Forest gig, so I was there a little bit earlier in Kent. This was one of the final live gigs that we've had from Paul. Um, I think Edinburgh came just a couple of days later, if I remember yeah. rightly. It's, I mean, again, we talk about constantly moving forward. True Meanings had come out the previous year, but there was nothing played from that album at all. But we had Stone Foundation, Mick Talbot came up for Shouts at the Top, Leah Weller was on doing You Do Something to Me, and you were there taking photos. 
great sense. Yeah, it was fantastic. Gig. I mean, I love going to gigs when you. I mean, part of the whole gig experience for me now is when you know people, and it'll be walking to the gig, walking down the front. People come up to you at the front. Even one, even one of my family who I hadn't seen for, for years was at the gig and came and said hello, which was great. Um, but that's a big part of it for me. You do get the shopping list sometimes. Sometimes you just step into the pit, and it somebody will say, "Can I have a set list? Can I have a plectrum? Can I get this?" And it's like, oh, literally, I'm, I'm here for three songs. And I'm at, you know, so sorry, but no. They still um, need the set list. They haven't done the songs. Yeah, well, yeah. I've seen people take them when the band are on. And it's like, I've had to try and get it back off someone once to, get, to put it back. But it was, yeah, it was a great gig. And I only I had the first few songs, which was fine. But I'd also taken my, um, it's called a bridge camera, along with me. And so I then obviously carried on afterwards. And I got, I mean, I got some nice shots. And um, obviously you're a lot further away. It's not the same quality. But sometimes it's just about the moment. You can't get, and it's a hung up again, on, on the quality of of the image because it's not going to be the same but there's one I got a shot at the end with the band all on the stage taking a bow and Andy Croft in fact he just messaged yesterday about it I said to him did you ever t- love to see that video that you took because he had his phone video in here Paul was looking on into the phone to see what obviously the audience in front and it's the shot I got of him on the stage but it was great it was a great gig and we never knew then that it was going to be such a long time yeah, of in, course. till we see him again. And, we, and when we talk about a set list, I mean, that was, I mean, to a certain extent, there were quite a lot of greatest hits. Yeah, Peacock Soup, Broken Stones, Above the Clouds from the early solo years, Style Council, and Weather Changing Moves. Have you ever had it? Oh, yeah, but- I mean, great. And then the jam, we had Malice, we had Precious, Start, That's Entertainment, Man in the Corner Shop. I mean, this that's a pretty bloody good set list, isn't it, <laughs> to be fair? Oh, yeah. I mean, it must be, I don't know how he even, where he starts to, to choose them. And it's good that sometimes, you know, it's not just you expect the same ones all the time. If he didn't play Malice, it wouldn't be the end of the world for me because I've heard it so many yeah, times. Yeah. Still love to hear it. But then sometimes, there's, like you say, there's stuff from Wildwood and Stanley Road, which I'd love to hear those. So it, it must be so difficult for him because he's got such a great back catalogue. Where some people, it must be hard sometimes to actually make sure you've got enough songs. Um, so in the crowd, the 40th anniversary edition, um, we ought to say how um, how this is coming along. So this is going to be released next year. People are able to pre-order right now. That's right. It's um, because the first book sold out. I mean, the first one was done, not saying it was rushed, but it was very quickly. Stuart, Debo and Ian Snowball had done Thick as Thieves. And because it had gone just like a few months before, and because I had so many pictures, uh, they ended up giving me like a whole chapter in, in that book. And because there was a lot of it, because it went really well, there was interest in the same publisher. So they, obviously I had all this stuff in, in the shoebox, all these slides and negatives. And um, so there was interest to do a book. So we did it really quickly. I think we had the first conversation in the December and the book was done in May, out in May, which considering it was made in the Far East and shipped across, that was really fast. And I think we did, I think two and a half thousand standard copies and there was a few other hardback versions as well. But they all sold out within, I think like two or three years. Uh, yeah, within yeah, by the time of the Liverpool exhibition, they were all sold. I think I had a couple of copies, and that was it left. I think um, eighteen ninety nine. It was retail for, and I, and I got my fifty pence a copy commission or whatever you call it, author's fee or whatever it was. And um, and then you see them on eBay now, and I see them go for like three four hundred quid. I've already had my fifty pence. <laughs> yeah, you're not getting that. Are you? Like, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't get any more. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, because, and it's nice that they don't, people don't sell them because I guess it means they want to keep them. You know, that's a nice thing when somebody wants to keep something. I mean, I've, I've never been in this for the money. Just as well, I've never been in it for the money because I wouldn't have made much. But so we wanted to redo the book um, because I think there's enough interest out there, and people kept saying, "Can I get a, can I get a copy?" And are you going to redo it? I thought rather than just do it again, let's see what what can we do to make it better, a better quality print and have more time on it as well. And also to have some unseen. It was the first time we, I think we ran over the page number by about 30, 40 pages, you know, and the publishers was, were, were, were always very happy, but we kept finding stuff to go in. We said, look, rather than just redo it, let's do it as an updated version. And I didn't want it to be, you know, like five pictures of people hadn't seen because that would just, I feel like I'll be, you know, I'm a, I say I'm a fan. So it would be like ripping off the fans if you did that. It's got to be bigger and better and have stuff that is that you hadn't seen the first time. And for whatever reason, some of these weren't in the first time. Some of it was because, say there was 10 from Guildford. I did want to put another five from Guildford because I already had quite a few. But some of those, but those five might have been better than some of the shots from another gig. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. So it was trying to get stuff that people hadn't seen. Uh, and even some of the Chiswick shots, there's stuff that, I mean, I think I did 160 pictures. And there's lots that weren't seen. Some aren't any good. There was things like they were in the shadow. There was like pillars. Again, now I would just automatically use a flash or something. But uh, then I didn't know. Two people would be fine and one would be so dark and you can't do anything about it. It's not like now with digital, you can recover it. Um, so the idea was to do a new and improved version 
of the book and a like, hardback one and uh, make it a better version for people. And for people not just who got the first one, hopefully, but people who missed out the first time as well. And you're together with the team who have made the Soul Deep book in 2021 yeah, as well. Steve. I mean, that's a beautiful production. So we know the kind of quality that you talk yeah, about. Yeah, fantastic but- book. Have you sat down together with each other going through these pictures? Have they been surprised um, at what you've unearthed? Well, I did. I had a load of stuff that I'd stay. I, I mean, I'm, we haven't actually been able to sit down together. I mean, I met them when they at the uh, the printers where they're sold where they were signing copies of Soul Deep, but we'd already had a few conversations. I really wanted Stuart involved for lots of reasons. He's, he's a good friend of mine. He's a good guy. He knows what he's doing with this, and it meant that it was really important for me to have him because there's things that I wouldn't have been able to do that I know Stu would, would be good at. Steve's a very good designer. So had, it was important to have the right people. I basically give Steve, he's got all of my negatives and slides, which is quite nervous when you hand the bag over. You don't want to let go of most. Because these, you know, these are the only copies of these things, you know. And um, I told him some of the ones, and I sent him got rough scans of some of them as well. Um, but the good thing was we had all the original scans. So some of the ones that were in the first book won't be included, but there'll be others as well that people never saw the first time. Uh, and some, yeah, I'll say there was different reasons why they didn't go in, but some maybe should have gone the first time. I don't know how many is going to be, but I hope there's going to be at least 30 plus, probably more unseen images. But they had to be good enough as well. It's not just, here's a few yeah, crappy yeah. ones we found that no one's seen, but we'll stick them in anyway. It was never going to be like that. They had to be good enough. You don't want to give anything away, obviously. But no. is, was there anything where you bought it out and you just went, whoa, this is incredible? Yeah, there was a couple. There was a couple which which I don't know why they didn't go in the first one. And uh, it was, I can't understand why we didn't do it. And I thought that was just a special shot. Yeah, there was. I, mean, I think we were careful the first time. But I think it was when you look at it, I mean, sometimes when I look back at my old pictures, you can't be overly critical because they were from the time, you know, and when the gear you had and, and everything. Um but I kind of look now and think, you know, I'm what I'm doing now, you know, the gear's better. I've got better access. The lighting's better sometimes. You know, it's, it's hard. To, it's not. It's like trying to compare watching a football match in high definition now on a 50-inch telly to watching football on a 12-inch black and white TV, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, 40 years ago, whatever it was. And so um, it's just not a fair comparison. The point I was trying to make was they weren't necessarily – you kind of look at things – and say, are they technically good? Is it in focus? Sometimes a great shot can be a really blurry shot. Um, it hasn't got to be technically good. I, I would never I would never describe myself as a technical photographer. Obviously, the stuff you know to take pictures, but it's all about, it's, I don't get hung up on F-stops and shutter speeds, which some people do. It's just get, using those things to get the shot I want. That's how I, that's how I think of it. There, there was one shot from Guildford, which the first time worked, when we did an exhibition, little exhibition, um, we weren't going to include it. It's Paul jumping in the air. And he's, he's just a blur. You can see he had the, this was the first night at Guildford. So he had the black Fred Perry on. It was the black Rickenbacker with the W um, sticker with the, on the red background under the strings. And he had like red and black bowling shoes on. So it was a lot of red and black in this picture. And he's in front of Rick and it's just a blur. See, now it'd be so much sharper probably because the closer and better gear. But, um, but I didn't like, left it the first time, but it was something I mean, he looked at it. So I think some of those other people's reaction to a picture can change my own view of it. Some people said, that's such a great shot. And I was like, it's, a bit, it's really blurred. And they said, yeah, but you can see the, you know, the action and that's, what, and that's what it was like, some of the gigs. And then, it's, and then you kind of think, you look at it, even though you've taken it, you look at it with fresh eyes and you see it differently. Yeah, I think that's the thing I was going to say about your, some of your, your work. You, it really does capture that excitement. You feel like you're in that gig because of your unique position of where you're taking the shots from and stuff. But things like that where, yeah, the legs are a blur or the guitars are blur. You feel like that energy coming off the stage and that kind of ferocious nature of some of these gigs as well, which is, is brilliant. I love it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think sometimes it's just to try and capture it. Because it's not like a video when you can see move people movement and things like that. It's... It's a still image. I think I can't help but think of like sports photography in a way where sometimes you see a shot and it's that moment, that, that second in time captured forever. And sometimes with a gig, it's, it's like that. I mean, obviously there's no sound or anything, but you can see, you know, sometimes you can see successful, even sometimes um, with the audience. I mean, I never got pictures of the audience really of the jam because if I'd been in the pit, I would have turned around and taken pictures, but I was never in the pit. So I didn't do it. And of course, everyone, people were either in the darkness with me or in front of me with their backs to me. So you didn't really get, I think I've got a couple of shots, literally one when I played, just finished the last gig at Guild, not their, not their last gig, but the last gig, an ultimate gig at Civic, at Guildford Civic Hall. The last song was The Gift and there's a shot, the last shot I took was Bruce jumping in the air and the last, very last shot is just a, as Rick's about to hit the cymbals. And then I took one more shot as the, the house lights came up of the audience all sweaty, just about to leave. And that was one of the few times, I think, yeah, probably apart from where you can see a couple of faces in the audience. And uh, we actually got an audience at a jam gig. You know, and people say, oh, have you got pictures of such and such? And it's like, 
no, because you wouldn't have had to see you anyway. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. like silhouette. You, know? <laughs> you mentioned um, doing an exhibition previously with the last time the book came around. Is that in the planning for this time? Because it would be great to see these these photos printed out in the flesh, huge big versions of them. Yeah, there's an exhibition coming up uh, at the Barbican Centre in London. They have a music library, and they've had um, they've had some really good photographers in the past. I can't, I can't believe how I was sort of sneaked in a little bit, but um, but but they've, but they've invited me to have this exhibition, and it was put back because of COVID. It would have been this year, and now it's going to run from uh, mid January to May, uh, twenty twenty two, and it'll have um, there'll be pictures of mine from Paul's from the Jam, a few from the Style Council. I did get a few, and then from his solo career as well. There'll be um, pictures of um, there'll be some unseen stuff. There'll be some memorabilia of mine, mostly based around the photographs of Paul's. But there'll be a few unseen things that people obviously haven't seen before. So I'm really excited. I've now really got to get my finger out and get the work done and get it all ready. But yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited about. It. I don't even know how that's going to work. It's a free place. It's a free entry. So it run for a few months. So I'm sure we'll arrange some dates when people can come along. But I think people can just come along. Anytime, anyway. So, well, maybe we can do something with the podcast around the time and stuff like that. Do a special edition oh, from brilliant. down there. So, be really nice. You can walk. You can walk me around the pictures. How does that sound? Oh, that'd be brilliant. How about you, me, and Paul walk around and we just? <laughs> I'll be up for that. I mean, yeah, you... Absolutely. <laughs> but actually, there's one picture I should have mentioned, which was um, 2017, the Kind Revolution tour, and there's a picture of him on the piano in Reading. I think it is. Um, oh yeah. And wasn't there, you have like a rule, sometimes in the pit or in, you have like a rule where it's no flash. So you've just got this yeah. wonderful photo of Weller on the piano. The, the normal rule, standard rule is is three songs, first three songs, no flash. That's kind of it. And that, which, which actually started, I had to find out about this being the um, sad person I am. It's, uh, it started with Bruce Springsteen. And the reason it happened was because to get a photo pass for Springsteen was easier than getting a ticket. So you would have, you'd have 50 photographers taking pictures with flash throughout the set to the point where it was just ridiculous so that's when the, that's when the no flash rule came in because of Bruce and then it became three songs um, but with Paul the first three songs he's always on guitar so unless you've got a pass that allows you for longer which I wasn't going to get but I'd seen this shot of him on the piano obviously during the gigs where the camera's gone away now watching the rest of the show I thought it was such a great shot with him on the piano so it was the last night of the tour. So I did go old school, sneak my little camera. I had two cameras in my pocket. Um, and one is literally not much bigger than my phone, a little Sony. It's only like a 2470. Unless you weren't in the first two rows, it wouldn't be any good because you, you, anything further, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't be good enough. But I had seen this shot in my mind of the shot I wanted to capture. I'm on the piano with the spotlight. And I was one back from the front and I got the shot on the little camera. So it wasn't as good quality. But the funny thing was um, they put it on the website, on Paul's website, and ate Paul Weller HQ and Paul Weller News. So it was great that they used it, and um, it was nice to capture it. Yeah, it's a brilliant. No, it's a lovely shot, that one, I have to say. Lovely. Um, this has been so brilliant, Derek. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Good luck with the new book. Um, I will share Thank all you. the links in the show notes for this podcast so people can pre-order and stuff like that. And I'm really looking forward to seeing that. I have two final questions for you. As you'll know, as a listener to this podcast, I'm sure, you're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life. It can be The Jam, The Style Council, or Solo. What are you going to go with? I'm going to choose Gravity. Oh. Because it's such a beautiful song. I think we heard it well with He played it. I think the first time we heard it might have been in Brighton, I think. Yeah, you were there for like, it was this pre-True Meanings gig, wasn't it? it yeah, was yeah. Like, yeah, that's right. And yeah. it wasn't, we hadn't heard this before and it was, what is this sort of me and my wife in it? We both loved this song. And um, I think in some ways, given the way he's been with his music, it makes more sense that it is more recent. I mean, I could have easily picked a jam song, maybe that would have been obvious. Gravity is such a beautiful song and I could listen to it. I mean, it's a great album just listen to Driving Home Late. It's brilliant. So that would have been, that would be my favourite song. I might change my mind next week. Yeah. <laughs> that's allowed that's allowed um, and obviously the point of this podcast is for me to be able to interview Paul Weller a man that I've never managed to interview in my radio career if it happens what should I talk to him about is there a question you'd like answered oh blimey I've read, I've, read so many, I've read so many things where he's been asked questions can't think of something I would have asked. I mean I would have asked about the Beatles had I, if I hadn't known that, that would have been the question I would have asked. I love the Beatles thing because I, I was talking to Sonia Phillips, who directed um, "You Do Something to Me" and Broken Stones videos. She said when she first met Paul, he just gave her a massive box of Beatles videos and said, "Watch that lot, and then we'll talk about uh, uh, directing the film." <laughs> he was just carrying around this huge, big box of Beatles films. Yeah, I think, I think if I had to ask him something. I think I would say, "Play me a song, not one of yours necessarily." That I've never that that I would have never have heard 
that you think I should know? Oh, that's a great question. There's so many things. I've heard him ask before, what advice would you give yourself a young well who said, well, I, you know, I wouldn't, you know, why should I tell myself, you know, just do what you did? There's so many things like that I've heard him being asked. That would be the ones that would kind of spring to mind. But I think, no, just pick out something from your collection that you know I wouldn't have heard. Yeah, and play it to me. Or play a song that I that you've written that I never would have heard yet. No one else has heard. Oh, yes, that'd be That'd be really cheeky. That'd yes, be perfect. Yes. That'd be a two-part question. <laughs> I was thinking this the other day because um, the Beatles' Let It Be Deluxe album is out. And A, I was thinking, I wonder if Paul gets these things because he's such a massive fan. He must be there, like, from yeah. the queue, order, ordering pre-order on Amazon or whatever. I was thinking there's a lot of, there must be stuff in the Weller Vault where we can, in years to come, there'll be the next version of Fat Pop with all the other bits and pieces around that time yeah. as well. There must be stuff in the in the archive, mustn't there, that we haven't heard yet. Yeah, I mean, there there's stuff, I mean, I think, I know the jam sort of stuff is, you know, the old stuff has come out. But there's still going to be stuff around. In fact, a friend of mine, after I should mention this really, there was a load of tapes from when they were on Go Disc, a um, load of DAT tapes that someone had, had abandoned, and he's got a copy of these tapes. So, that, so we we're trying to find a DAT player to listen to him <laughs> on. So I need to find, in fact, I need to ask him, that's another question, to ask him, because there might be something we've never heard on yeah. there. You, can, you know, this with these, some of these rep companies, things go in the vaults. And things go missing. I think it's a bit like the police evidence locker room or whatever. Things things go missing that shouldn't. And some, I guess there'll be stuff that people could never share because if they did, they would be in big trouble. So you could never share it. Almost like somebody who has got you know, a stolen painting in a room that only they could watch it in, <laughs> which is a bit weird. But I guess there'll be things like that. But um, yeah, I always like to I always like to hear acoustic versions of things. And just sometimes you need just, just the song, like a voice and guitar, a voice and piano. And I think if it's a good song or a great song, that's when it stands out. You don't always... This is great to hear with the full band and the arrangements and everything else. But sometimes when you just hear it's stripped back, you know, it's, it's it's a beautiful thing to hear. Yeah, love it, love it. Um, well, I'm with you on that, my friend. Hey, Derek, this has been so lovely. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure and you've made it really enjoyable. Thank you. My thanks once again to Derek D'Souza. Check out my show notes to find out more about the book. In the crowd, The Jam Snapped, 40th Anniversary Edition, and that upcoming exhibition at the Barbican in London too. All you need to do is go to my website, it's paulwellerfanpodcast.com. Don't forget, if you've enjoyed this episode, please share it on your social media channels and in all of those Facebook group forums for The Jam, The Star Council, and Paul Weller Solo. Please do leave a review as well. You can buy me a coffee and find more information about my guests on my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com, and get in touch on social media. Yeah. Find me on Twitter at Weller Fan Pod or on Instagram and Facebook. It's Paul Weller Fan Podcast. Next up, three podcasts in three days, starting on Tuesday, the 28th of December, each with a different honorary counsellor. So if you love the Style Council, you're going to love these. Make sure you subscribe or follow wherever you get your podcasts and find out more on my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. I'll see you next time.